Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Contract Packing Associates webinar uh, titled Driving Consumer-Centric Packaging and Product Innovation. Uh, my name is Ron Puvek. I am the Managing Director of the Contract Packaging Association. Brian, would you advance? Thank you. Uh, just a little bit about the Contract Packing Associates. We've been around since 1992, and we've been promoting the growth and welfare of our members throughout industry exposure and a variety of networking programs. The CPA members uh, comprise the nation's largest and leading contract packages and manufacturers from all types of contract manufacturing and packaging functions for brands and CPGs. The contract packaging associates serves the needs of the industry through continuing education, market knowledge, and customer relationships. Next slide, please, Brian. Just a few a few factoids about the industry. This industry is growing at an extremely high rate. Notice 11.9, actually our last survey said 12.2. Uh, over the last five years, compound annual growth rate. We network, we have up to 10 events a year. And this webinar is a uh, part of our education and um, networking program. Um, so let me just transition into the webinar. First of all, all of you are on mute. If you have any questions, please use the question box and we will respond to as many questions as we can. And we also send some feedback via an electronic link, so be prepared for that. The webinar is being recorded and it will be, it will be posted on the CPA website at contractpackaging.org within a day. Today's presenters are Brian Wagner, who's the co-founder and vice president of PTIS LLC, and Phil Roos, CEO, Great Lakes Growth Works. I'm going to turn it over to Brian now. Please, Brian, take it away. Great. Thanks, Ron. Uh, so this is Brian Wagner. A little bit of an agenda, just an overview. Um, I'll provide introductions, a little more detail on my friend Phil Roos and I, uh, who we are, why we're here, and then talk about um, the relationship between packaging and the consumer and, and hopefully surprise some of the, the listeners uh, with some of our experience and maybe maybe how, pack, how important packaging is beyond what we typically think about. Um, followed by some friends and opportunities, and uh, I'll be able to turn it over to Phil at that point. And then uh, he will also talk about innovating with consumer today. As you know, the um, the overall headline for this uh, webinar is transcending disruption. And Phil and his his uh, team at Great Lake Growth Works actually lead a lot of, of work around disruptive innovation, and he'll be able to share a bit more on that. Some best practices and and some things that are, are being done differently and very effectively through uh, the global pandemic um, and, and some methodologies that are being used uh, online uh, that I think will be helpful. And then some closing thoughts with details on what it means for, uh, for all of you. So first of all, a little, little bit about Phil. Uh, so uh, about, I think it was about 20 years ago we met. I had just the Kellogg Company with Mike Richmond, who some of you know, and we co-founded PTIS. And we were introduced, uh, and we were in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We were introduced to Phil Roos a couple hour drive away. I think it was a year before he started the Arbor Strategy Group. And that led to a 20 year friendship and a lot of collaboration. And eventually somewhere around 2009 or 2010, Phil sold the Arbor Strategy, Strategy Group. 2011, we sold PTIS. And um, and here we are now, we've got PTIS back and Phil started a new firm called Great Lake uh, Growth Works and really have a lot of respect for him as a very intelligent person and just a, a good friend and a, a really solid human being. So I, I think you'll enjoy uh, hearing from Phil. So a bit on why we're here. So um, we talked about uh, disruption in the, in the marketplace and um, we like doing a lot of work, work around foresight and looking forward. And frankly, this COVID thing has really disrupted things. Um, the market has gone through a lot of changes, but we're still looking forward to innovating in packaging and product uh, innovation and differentiating brands through those, influencing shoppers, driving growth, understanding the world around consumers um, and how they, how they react, behave. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about observational research and how important that is to finding quite, a, quite often unarticulated needs um, that we can solve through, through product and packaging innovation. Um, the webinar is going to highlight trends. So Phil's going to talk a bit about uh, trends in the marketplace and, again, how we can leverage packaging and product innovation to, uh, to innovate 
al aligned with trends um, and it worked to really uh, disrupt the marketplace as well. Um, Phil will be presenting some approaches, as I mentioned, and then finally we're going to we're going to share out implications um, for you, uh, whether you're linked directly with the contract ma manufacturing and contract packaging industry, and that's the CMCP that we referenced throughout the presentation. Or I know some of you are with brands, some of you are with supplier companies, and hopefully this will will resonate with all of you. So back in 1997, I joined the, the Kellogg company and I was really fortunate to have an opportunity to lead an innovation initiative, starting with uh, linking with the best of the best globally in terms of consumer insights specifically for packaging. And I worked with the son-in-law of this gentleman, Louis Cheskin, and unfortunately never got to know him. He passed away in the early 80s, but I subsequently have read all of his books and he, he wrote a number of books and he was just an incredible leader and coined the term sensation transference, which is really about looking at a product or a package and forming judgments around the qualities of what's inside it, of, of how it's gonna perform, how it's gonna work, and even in the case of packaging, how it's gonna taste. And there's some great examples. I mean, you can see in the, the header that he's, he, he helped create the Marlboro Man and the Gerber Baby. Um, he was responsible for the Tide Box, the, the black swirl on the orange background, and even launches of Ford, the Ford Mustang and Lincoln Continentals, all of which were great successes and all of which um, leveraged sensation transference. So when you saw features and attributes of a design, you connected that with how the, you expected the product that was going to perform. One quick example, really, in the, in the packaging world, one of my favorites goes way back when probably people drank more brandy, frankly, but um, the leader in the area was uh, E&J Gallo. Uh, they had the, the number one brandy. Christian Brothers worked really hard to develop an, an equivalent or better brandy in terms of blind taste testing. And then they put it in the bottle, then they put it on the shelf, and they couldn't get out of the bottom slot in the marketplace, and they couldn't understand why. And so Louis Cheskin got involved and he, he put the Christian Brothers brandy in, in, in the E&J bottle and vice versa. And sure enough, the Christian Brothers brandy got better taste test, test results when you could see the package and when you could see the brand. And then they started to strip, strip away the features. They took off the labels. Uh, they did a number of different things and finally found out that the, the thing that made the big difference and I'm not sure these are the same bottles at the time, but the thing that made the difference was the Christian Brothers Brandy had a bottle that was more like a wine bottle, which was perceived to be inferior to brandy in terms of the product. And so they all they did is change the silhouette of the bottle, went back to the same branding, the same color, and they took over the number one slot uh, ahead of E&J Gallo. So it's, it's, it's amazing that packaging, amazing to me and a lot of people that packaging can have a huge influence on even the flavor of a product um, in terms of perceptions. So Phil and I actually, when we met, um, he had he had just acquired just started the Arbor Strategy Group and acquired a collection of what we called new and once new products, and he he branded the collection as New Product Works, and he acquired it from a mutual friend, the late Bob McMath, who was just a, an amazing guy, and it started this collection something like 40 years earlier. Um, when you think about hundreds and thousands of products that are launched every year, in fact, it's been a tens of thousands launched every year um, in the United States. Some of the research shows that 90 or suggests that 90% fail within the first three years. Um, there's some other research that says that most product life cycles are only three to five years long. And we know that the contract packaging and manufacturing industry uh, is 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 playing such a huge role because the big brands can't afford to to build brick and mortar uh, factories anymore. And so being able to test and learn is such an important part of our our industry in the in the food and beverage and consumer product industries. So a couple of these examples um, that come to mind. And, and Bob McMath was on almost every major network. He was on the Tonight Show. He took these stories and they were they were so entertaining for people. But uh, Frito-Lay lemonade was actually a product at the time. Um, it didn't last long in the marketplace. <coughs> Excuse me. Clairol 
launched a touch of yogurt shampoo. People actually thought it was yogurt, not shampoo. And they thought they were supposed to eat it. Um, and your top top left of your screen, the wine and dine dinner was it was kind of a an elegant uh, poultry based uh, hamburger helper. And wine and dine dinner, you you took these ingredients and you mixed them with the chicken and you cooked them. And people were perceiving that that wine was for drinking while you cooked. And in fact, it was an ingredient intended to be part of the mix. It also failed miserably. Um, Gerber Singles on the bottom left. Uh, Gerber did some great consumer insight research and they found that seniors had a need for food that wasn't all that different from baby food. And they launched this product and um, unfortunately it failed because uh, the product might've been great, but um, there was an aura of being single and a senior and, um, and also of a baby food jar representing um, something other than what seniors wanted to be seen buying. Um, a lot more color to these these stories and there's thousands and thousands of them but um kind of entertaining and, and kind of interesting that the big brands who should know what they're doing in terms of consumer insight frankly don't get it right that often and they seldom really understand packaging uh very well um and therefore there's opportunities for some of you as as leaders and and whether you're in a, a packaging department and a brand or you're with a supplier company or an OEM even, or with a, a contract manufacturer, if you really want to differentiate yourself, there's an opportunity to take your new solutions and test them with consumers before you take them as a potential solution to the big brands. So what's, what's it all mean? Um, obviously, well, obviously to me, packaging is the product. Uh, purchase decisions are made at that shelf in something like 4.6 uh, seconds. I'm not sure what the research is for e-commerce and online, but Consumers make up their mind very quickly. And in doing research, it's really how you talk to them, get at their needs, um, understand attitudes and actual behaviors. And observation is critical to packaging. And I, I always talk about the need for creative people, engineers, marketing, branding, um, involving suppliers in research, because we all see potential solutions very differently. Um, it's, a, it's a best practice. Not a lot of companies do it. You also need to understand and test in context. So um, you can't just text in a sterile uh, conference room. You need to get into people's homes, into their cars, at their workplace, with the places where they're using product to really get the best insights. And then you need to recognize packaging is really integral to product development, not an afterthought. It's part of the brand, it's part of the product, and it needs to be prioritized as such. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Phil Roos, my good friend, and uh, Phil, hopefully we got volume and you can take it over. Yeah, this will be the moment of truth. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah. It's uh, abjectly failing in, in not being able to connect through my phone uh, despite a lot of tries, so hopefully my am sounding okay. You're breaking up a little bit, but I can understand you. Okay, I will talk with you. <laughs> Uh, so that you can hear me again. So I'm going to talk a little bit about market trends and the role they play, and then link that to how how that gets reflected in packaging and the importance of that. And then kind of segue from there uh, a little later on, just talk a little bit about some ways that you can integrate consumers into the process very early and doing some of this work. So. Uh, this is kind of a basic framework that probably doesn't sound too foreign to any of you, but it's pretty central to the work our firm does. I know the work uh, uh, Brian and the PTIS folks do, which is the idea that if you're, we live now in a world that's changing at warp speed, and, and if you need to be reminded of that, just reflect back on the last three or four months, and it just seemed like a whole new world every week or two. In that kind of a setting, it's not enough, we're going to talk about consumer insight, but it's not enough to go talk to your consumers and figure out what their needs are. You really have to marry that with an understanding of, of, of foresight. Where is the market, or the way I would actually frame it is, how is my world going to change in the next three or four years? Because I think that's for most businesses, uh, everything's up, and up for grabs, our business models, our customers, the way we do business. So if we can bring together uh, a view of the future with a really deep understanding of people's needs and the insights from our consumers, then we've got a, 
a view against which we can innovate. So uh, if you could slip ahead, Brian, um, I'm going to try to have a, a, a complete discussion about trends in a short re webinar like this. And I'm, so I'm going to, I've laid up here on the slide a, a few of the kinds of macro uh, dynamics that are affecting most of our businesses in one way or another. And I think these are pretty, pretty common. Um, and some of them are accelerated or have been changed in light of COVID. And so we'll talk about that a bit. So this may be a somewhat familiar list of things that are on your mind. Uh, I think that a big one is an evolution in how people shop. And we all know about e-commerce in general and the impact that's having. Uh, but there are many dimensions to it. Uh, there's frictionless or ease of being able to make a purchase. That has big implications for packaging and product and the way it's designed to, to facilitate that. Um, the experiential uh, aspect to shopping as well. Uh, people want more to buy more than a product than a package. They want an experience of it. Uh, the whole direct-to-consumer and home delivery world has really uh, revolutionized uh, the, the businesses we're all in. Ubiquitous tech, tech in everything we do to one degree or another, even if it's just how we order. Competition that we never knew existed. Uh, people who are selling things that we might sell, but they're selling them on the web or they're selling them in some other channel. Uh, and it's just really opened up to be uh, a tough thing to track that, or to answer that question, who is my real competition? Consumers who care, that's really about uh, people uh, caring what their, how their brands respond to different situations. And we see that right now with the Black Lives Matter protests. We see it with COVID and, and the health risks. Uh, but the way that a brand or a company uh, the view they bring to the world, how they respond to the things going on in the world around us is really important that people buy or don't buy based on that. Sustainability, and we're all very familiar with that, but that's assuming we're here to stay and we're here to stay and constantly evolving. And then brands as stories. And I think that's got really profound implications for packaging because packaging in many cases may be the primary way that those stories get conveyed and they have to be conveyed in a simple way, not with a million words. Um, so when we do this kind of work with some of the innovation work that we do, we actually do something we call a disruptor analysis, which is to look at some of these dynamics, but in a very custom way for your industry, because they are a little different, they have different manifestations. And if you understand those, you can really figure out where the opportunities to actually catch the wave of disruption and disrupt rather than being disrupted. The last thing I'd say about this is that uh, there are some potentially lasting impacts on this set of trends and, and the values that consumers have in light of COVID. And we've seen that we, we've been tracking and doing a lot of consumer conversations with people of different cohort groups. And uh, there really are some things that uh, seem like they may be sticking. Certainly, uh, increased importance of product safety, uh, but uh, also tried and true simplicity rather than quirkiness uh, seems to be something that uh, sort of a general trend. Uh, where Coca Cola just announced that they're kind of pairing back uh, a lot of their innovation pipeline to focus on uh, sort of trusted brands and, and the bigger ideas. So if we start with that uh, foresight, then we have to match that with insight if we're going to get a view of where there are real opportunities and actually threats for us going forward. Uh, we're thinking about what will really resonate with consumers. And it's not just the functional needs. You know, it's not going to break. It's easy to handle. Uh, all of those kinds of things. But back to, uh, Mike, uh, back to Brian's point about sensation transference. There's a real emotional element here that not any of us in the packaging world would interact with it realize that uh, we're, we're trying to help express an emotional benefit that the product has, but that can be conveyed and reinforced in the packaging, whether it's about uh, a sense of well-being or connectedness or uh, feeling good about myself or just trying to convey an experience. And uh, a big part of the research that we often do to understand this is, is sort of mapping out the consumer journey. Uh, how do they get to making a purchase decision? What are the influences? And we very much, we are very often fine from that. 
uh, some important emotional drivers that uh, need to be conveyed in whatever new products are packaging we bring to market. And uh, lastly, in this section, section I want to just give an example or two of uh, packaging linking to consumer trends, if you don't mind advancing that, Brian. Um, so um, I think one of the best ones is up in the upper left-hand corner. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Loop. Uh, but this is a, a zero-waste platform, uh, a circular shopping platform where you can uh, buy your favorite products, but buy them in reusable package. And they will deliver them to your door. They'll pick, you don't have to worry about recycling. They'll take it, uh, away, take away the empties afterwards, and and clean them and make them possible for other people to enjoy. A really kind of a breakthrough platform that really makes a statement about that sustainability trend that I talked about, uh, but ends up interacting in people's lives in a really practical way. And then there's some, you know, kind of more basic things like value. You know, the role that private label is playing there. You see that. The Walgreens brand next to the Listerine brand, they look pretty similar, don't they? Uh, convenience in, in, a, in a line offering that can be stackable or even single serve. Uh, and I think that the, the, the Tide example is a good one, so it's sort of showing the impact of different ways that people are shopping. And uh, that's a package that's designed entirely for e-commerce, where there are different needs of going through that channel. Uh, it may be it's meant to be uh, avoiding leaks and damage and have a lunar footprint and a variety of other things that uniquely uh, fit that channel. And I think we're going to, it's going to be more and more importance in reflecting some of those big macro trends in terms of the innovation that we bring to market. Okay, so this, just wrapping up this subsection, uh, just when we think about the importance of packaging, you know, as uh, Brian always says, the package is the product. Uh, purchase decisions are made uh, and perceptions are made through the packaging as well as the product itself. What we have to just keep in mind is that we need to think about the broader world around us, these disruptors or trends that are affecting us, and then linking those to insights. I'm going to talk more about insights now, and then really reflecting that in, in the ultimate execution that we bring to market. So I have one other topic, and this is hopefully a little bit juicy for, for all of you. Uh, it's really how do we actually, Brian talked about the importance of understanding the consumer, of bringing them into the process. And sometimes if you're a, if you're a uh, contract packaging company, uh, a contract manufacturer, you may be delivered an idea that some development work has, been, has happened with consumer input. But often the package itself hasn't really been integrated into that process. And I, I just want to make the case that that's a really important thing to do. It's important to do very early in the process because sometimes the packaging can be the thing that drives success or failure and it actually conveys all the wonderful things we want to convey. And then I, I, I want to also give some encouragement to actually doing some of this work of innovation, first of all, but then in bringing consumers into the process in, in an early stage. And to do it now, even though we're just emerging from lockdowns and we've got people working from home in a virtual environment, uh, but we've had to uh, very quickly in our practice pivot to doing all of the work that we often would do in a live setting to do it in it completely virtually, and I'm going to share a little bit of that learning and, and uh, make some suggestions about how to, how to do that when you're doing your own innovation efforts. So uh, let's start with the early part of consumer research. So this can certainly be done in person, focus groups, ethnographic research, uh, but uh, we've, there are online approaches to this that have been really proven. They've been around for 10, 15 years and, and uh, constantly evolving. And some of the things that we used to think we had to do live, we're finding can be done quite effectively, sometimes even better and more affordably through a virtual format. Um, the tools of the trade here, uh, there's the more, uh, somewhat more conventional approaches of focus groups and individual depth interviews, which really are a way to bring the life of voice, bring to life the voice of the customer in a way where you can actually see their reactions and see if they look at a product or a packaging execution, 
uh, or a conceptual idea, drawing an illustration of such, you can see which things kind of light up their faces, and that's really important. But I want to make the case for something Brian said earlier, which is the importance of contextual resource, research that's not done in the focus group realm, but it's done in the real world of the, the consumer's life. And the classic there is ethnographic or observational research when you're observing and interacting with consumers in their homes or when they're shopping and you're um, sort of you're doing as much observing as you are actually asking them questions. Uh, but there's a way to actually augment this with them doing some um, online blogging that can be connected to that, where they're recording some of their behavior over time, some of their observations, some of their feelings. As an example, if you're developing a new snack innovation, and you're trying to figure out the right product execution, the right benefits, and the right packaging that will bring that to life, having people record, take pictures of, record their thoughts, diary what's going on in their lives every time they have the urge to have a snack. And what's running through their mind? What are the other options to get a sense of the frame of reference of other packaging and product options and the roles they play in people's lives? It's figuring out where the gap is and where you can really stand out in that environment. And then there's something else we've been using a lot of, we call them online insight communities, where we actually uh, recruit a group of people, maybe 15, 20, 30 people, and we actually have them interact with each other through various exercises over time. And then sometimes we have them do individual activities and we bring them back together and we build ideas over time with them. So we can start out by, uh, you know, just asking about their needs and different insights into their lives, but then we can bring real world executions of packaging or product to them and get their reactions and then ultimately sort of build them into a, a fully fledged idea. So those last two are really contextual and have a, a big advantage in my mind. And then I, I, I started to almost uh, trip on my lines here and what I just said here, but there, there's a, what if you've already developed the, the sense of an idea, but now you want to really get to the idea of execution, or maybe you're working on a whole range of different ideas. Um, there's the whole consumer co-creation aspect of that, that we have now transfer all of our work in that space to an online format. We use a combination of um, what we call online boards. So it's basically uh, a way that we work with uh, a consumer or a set of consumers over time and we give them a series of activities. And often what we will start with is insights that we would have gathered in the first phase in the early stage of consumer work. So these would be a set of statements, accepted beliefs, or statements about problems that consumers run into for which there might be a need for a, a new product to, to address. So we might ask them to just prioritize those insights, tell us which of the things that we're listing here are the most important, then take the most important ones and give them another exercise where we show a set of, we call them trigger ideas for product and packaging and get their reactions to those and match them up to the insights. And then gradually over time, start to create um, more detailed graphical expressions of the proposition as well as uh, words on a page that we describe it. And sometimes we even add a quantitative step. Uh, we were doing a lot of this rapid quantitative testing, almost what we call it lightning strike. And uh, Brian is using that a lot too in their practice where you can get a quick read on an idea and execution of package. And uh, in a matter of uh, 24, 48, 72 hours, you know what's working and what isn't, and is it something that's likely to see, succeed in market? So all of this is, you might ask the question, because we're, you know, many of us uh, who do research sort of grew up on live research in person. Is it worth it to do online work? And is it worth it to do it right now when we're in, still in the, you know, hopefully the trailing edges of COVID, but I don't think it's going away completely for a while, unfortunately. And I think there's, there are a number of reasons why this is a really 
affordable, agile, and very useful way to get consumer input into whatever development efforts you might be doing on your own or conjunction or in conjunction uh, uh, with uh, branded partners uh, or retailers or others who are uh, bringing these to market. Uh, online methods are tried and true. We've been, as I said earlier, been around for a long time, and they work. So that's one reason why they can make sense. Um, they may not solve every part of the puzzle, but they're an important piece of the puzzle. And, and, and generally, it's that contextual piece that Brian was talking about. Uh, and I didn't have to go through all this, but, but um, I would, in sort of the fourth bullet on this page, I wouldn't underestimate the value of talking to consumers right now. I've heard some, some of our clients who have said, gee, I don't know, I don't want to talk to people when they're not themselves, when they're holed up at home, and when they, they may not be telling us things that will be reflective of what's happening in the real world. And certainly there's a little bit of filtering out of what they say right now. There, there's some things that are just about the here and now, but in the, in the sessions we go, there are some clear things that are um, going to stick when I mentioned some of the safety and sanitary kinds of considerations, wanting a lot of product assurance of quality and integrity that they may be uh, were as top of mind a few years ago or pre-COVID. But also what we find in the COVID environment, when people are holed up at home, some things that were small kind of latent needs problems become really big when you're in a limited environment. And I think it's really uh, actually an excellent time to go out there and find out what some of those are and be on the leading edge of addressing them as we move out of this. So I, bottom line is stay connected to your, your consumers and the end users of some of your products and packaging. I think that's really important. And last thing, I have just listed here, and you don't need to go through all this, but uh, there, there are some kind of best practices in terms of online research and approaches. I've kind of covered this already, but um, uh, this just kind of uh, talks about some of the differences and the advantages and disadvantages. Um, and I, I think we've sort of covered that already. That insight, focus groups, or depth interviews, that's really would be the ability to see people's expressions. Uh, and, and the nice thing about doing this now is people have time on their hands. I know people are beginning to return to work more so in some areas than others, uh, but there are a lot of people at home and they are ready to talk. And so it's a, an opportunity. It's actually a lot easier to execute um, a small or larger scale consumer research effort now than, than before. And then digital ethnographies and insight communities, as I said, uh, that's really about getting to the contextual elements, the real world of people's lives in their homes as they shop, as they go about their day-to-day -day lives. And there's some guidance in all of these. Um, we would do things a bit different than you would in a live setting. For instance, in a focus group, we wouldn't do an eight-person focus group generally. We'd do three or four people, maybe five at the max, uh, just because of the complexities of um, dealing with the technology. Uh, it's hard to have a free-for-all with lots of people talking at the same time because you can't hear any of them. So you can manage things like that a little bit better with a smaller group. So anyway, um, some conclusions from this, and I'll turn it back to Brian to, to wrap us up here. Uh, don't be afraid to innovate now. I, I really feel, and I'm hearing this from clients too, that after a couple of months of some degree of lockdown or business not being as usual, run as usual, there are companies and uh, I would say competitors out there who are who have taken that time, the last two or three months, to figure out how's the world going to be different, where are my consumers, and how do I bring some stuff to market that will make a difference. And I, I think it's also an opportune time if you're a contract packager or contract manufacturer, to begin bringing some of those ideas proactively, if you're not always doing that, to the brands that you're working with. Uh, because they're looking for ideas right now. And we're just getting to a point where people maybe have a little bit of budget to spend, and there's this is a real opportunity, and I think not losing touch with our consumers during a time like this is, 
is really the wrong thing to do. There are also some pretty scrappy, very cost-effective ways to do some of the stuff that I just talked about. So over to you, Brian, with some closing thoughts. That's great, Phil. Thank you. Um, very, very insightful. And I know we've been asked by a number of companies, uh, big and small, for what's what's happening with, with Consumer Insight now that people are quarantined and working remotely and so on. And Bill's been great in bringing us some of those methodologies and um, taking them together to our clients for uh, packaging design in particular. Um, and it's funny, as you were talking, I thought about our, our definition of design as we think about packaging. It's it's the look and feel, it's the form and function, and sometimes most importantly is the emotional connection to the brand. And a lot of people, especially technical folks, and men for that matter, uh, say that they don't shop emotionally, they shop logically, practically, but the, the truth is the research shows most, most purchases and decisions are actually 80% emotional. Um, and that this brings us to that a little bit that, you know, we, we look at value and how do you communicate value through packaging and package design and uh, the, the value is equal to benefits over cost versus a competition. Well, cost is always easy to quantify and easy to focus on, but the real and perceived benefits that packaging can communicate and deliver about the brand and about the product are really crucial. Um, they tend to be emotional. They tend to be about things like, like relevance and differentiation. Um, delivering portion control, communicating uh, the, brand the brand message as a brand asset, uh, emotional fulfillment. They're all, all very difficult things to quantify and business decision makers love to quantify things. But frankly, the most important things that go through the consumer's mind when they purchase are emotional and, and not always quantifiable. So it's an important thing to keep in mind uh, when doing research. So what's, what's it mean for uh, contract manufacturers, contract packagers, and also everybody in the, along the value chain? Um, we know that uh, packaging influences consumer product perceptions, including things like taste and flavor. Um, it's a critical asset, and uh, contract manufacturers, contract packagers can help deliver the brand promise. Brands want new solutions and value. We hear it all the time. Um, leading contract manufacturers, contract packagers, packaging suppliers should monitor consumer trends. If, you, if nothing else, monitor consumer trends and what's happening with them. Uh, there's plenty of journals, there's plenty of sources, webinars to understand what's happening with consumers and maybe how you might be able to differentiate brands in the marketplace. And we've worked with some to even conduct their own research. Um, we've had some bring a major brand to the table with them. We've done work with Bill's firm. And, uh, and brought them together and, and done work to identify new package opportunities, new opening features, formats, sealing technologies, a number of different things. Um, and, and the leaders are doing that. But also, uh, we, we believe suppliers, and we, we know some who ask to be involved in consumer research with the brand owners, the answer is not always yes, um, but also to see research. So, when brands go to their contract manufacturers and they say, you know, we're really, we'd love to put this, whatever this thing is, a new ingredient, say in a small pouch or a small sachet, and it should really be a unique and novel touch and feel and, and look with a great uh, convenient opening feature. Um, quite often and way too often, what happens is the contract manufacturer, the supplier says, well, we can't do any of that. Here's what we can do. And the big brands settle for whatever that solution is that can be manufactured today. Um, we really see an opportunity to not just be an order taker, but to push back on them a little bit, take this insight, and look for ways to modify your equipment and your materials to deliver what the insights really, really pulled out. So they, you know, probably the brand owner tested a concept that was a brand message. It was a specific product. It was in a package it really should stay in that package and not change to something else just because a contract manufacturer can make that something else. And we see collaboration and everything we do is key. If you want to get to market quicker, don't try doing it yourself. Um, whether you're an OEM, material supplier, converters, even universities, uh, associations like the Contract Packaging Association, um, CMCPs, everybody solves problems in new ways. Everybody brings something unique and different to the table. And the more you can collaborate, the more you're going to be be successful. Uh, and then, and then finally, products fail for many reasons. That 90% number I shared earlier 
It can be bad messaging. It can be one word in an advertisement. It can be a bad package that wasn't the package that was tested. It can be a flavor wasn't quite uh, what they what was tested in a uh, in in, the, um, in a, a blind sensory test, and then all of a sudden you put it in a different package, and it changes the perception of how that that performs. It can be so many different things, but our our job is to help you and help companies to be successful and improve improve the success rate. Uh, Procter and Gamble, I think, has been quoted as having a 55% success rate. So. 90% average doesn't apply to everybody. There are some really positive exceptions out there. And that gold standard that gets tested in consumer insight testing should be a gold standard that goes into a design brief, a product brief, and a marketing brief. And that's, that's again, the look and feel, form and function, design, emotional connection to the brand. So with that, Ron, uh, we'll wrap up and um, certainly uh, Phil and I can take any questions. Hey, great. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Phil. Appreciate this. And by the way, there's just an observation. There's a lot of agreement appears to be on the go to the consumer now and get the insight that, that now is the time to do that. So that's positive. And Phil, just to minimize the sound issues, I'll mute and unmute you if you don't mind during the conversation here. But we do have a good question. What are some of the leaders with respect to the understanding and using packaging to create new experience and solutions with packaging? Who wants to take that one? I'll go first right. since I'm unmuted. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, we, we've actually done a, a fair amount of benchmarking and best practice work around this. Um, <laughs> excuse me, I mentioned Procter & Gamble. They, they've been a leader for a long time. They really see packaging as part of the integrated solution in every one of their products and their whatever they have, 20 or $22 billion brands. Um, we hear uh, Nestle's name come up, Unilever's name come up. Um, oh, Quite often, uh, who am I missing? Pepsi, Coke. I mean, there are a number of companies who do it really well. Very few do it consistently very well. I, th I think most of those I mentioned are are great at uh, understanding consumer insight early on, and <clears throat> really, really trying to understand unarticulated consumer needs. And um, well, one of the best practices, and again, I think it's Procter and Gamble, is that on every one of their leading brands. Uh, we're at least told that every 18 months they go back to consumers and they test the relevance of, of their design, their package design. And if for some reason a color needs to change a little bit or a wording or a structural change, they make those changes very subtly so as not to disrupt what's in the consumer's mind. Phil, any add-ons? You listed everybody that was on my list, uh, but I, I might just talk about what is more the norm, uh, and I, I think that is uh, packaging being tested, we're talking sort of specifically about packaging, packaging being tested uh, late in the process. I mean, even some really big name companies that uh, you would recognize and think of as being at the high end of professionalism, uh, unfortunately, that is something that tends to happen, and I, and I think that's actually an opportunity for uh, the, the membership of this association, because uh, there may not be a function that really allows packaging to get involved early. And in all the work we do, is that's like part of the very first conversations, even the insight conversation. I think that's that's what's really needed, and, and uh, uh, there may be an opportunity to fill some of that gap for even some of the, uh, the larger brand partners. Great, thank you. I have an interesting one here. Uh, has the consumer become more complex to understand? And you were talking about filtering earlier. Can you give some insights on that? Phil, I'm going to give you that one. Has the consumer become more complex? Yes. To understand. Um, Wow, uh, that's a tough one to answer. I, I think um, I think at the core, if you think the core motivators that, that drive consumer behavior, I don't think those actually change. But the ways in which you can get those motivations addressed uh, have the, the number of things people are exposed to 
and with uh, particularly the advent of technology and e-commerce, the number of things that people see all the time, I think there's a lot of shorthand decision making and reaction uh, that is happening that needs to be decoded and can be difficult to, to decode. But it's not, when we had a much simpler uh, way that we bought and sold products uh, and uh, fewer choices, uh, maybe it was easier to decode. And I think that's why, back to that use of contextual research, why that's so important, uh, because there are a lot of these things people cannot even articulate what uh, the complexity of the decision making and, and the choices that are evaluated. You have to sort of see it in action, infer, and then, then pose a question, what's going on there, to really understand it. Right? Yeah, I, I would add on to that, that the, what we've, we've seen, you know, in my 30 some years in the industry is when a new technology becomes available in a category, consumer expectations rise. So that adds to a level of complexity because technology is moving so quickly. And if, if I can, you know, 20 years ago, I couldn't, I didn't have a smartphone. I couldn't go on there and research a product. Um, I didn't, I didn't have a, a, you know, a wine bottle I could scan with my, or, or a pack of Oreos I could scan with my phone and have characters jump off it. Um, you know, 20, 20 or maybe that's 30 years ago, 20, 20 years ago, uh, putting a zipper on a cheese pack, all of a sudden the entire shredded cheese category had to put reseal features on. So the complexity I think comes in, in the level of technology that becomes accepted. Um, that That's going to continue to advance and trying to anticipate that and get out ahead of it and make investments to deliver those things uh, to the marketplace will will continue to be important. Okay, we got some good good to hear about smart sensors. How soon would you see smart sensors on package, and what are the challenges of embedding smart sensors on packages? Uh, I'll I'll jump on that one, Phil. I'll I'll try. <laughs> so we know we know from a lot of our work that um, three key areas that are crucial in the packaging industry, looking out ten years. Uh, one is the circular economy and trying to figure out how to design products and packaging for the circular economy. I'm not thinking, thinking about disposal at end of life, but in, in reuse. Um, another one is e-commerce and direct to consumer. It's not going away. It's creating another level of complexity. And then the third one is the Internet of Things or the Internet of Packaging, which has a lot to do with, with building sensors and um, it's already being done quite often it's it's being done for those novel reasons like you know i can look at a wine bottle and and see the criminals uh jump jump into my phone or uh, a character jump off the oreo pack um however we're seeing at least in different categories different apart parts of the world so so one of them would be powdered infant formula uh the major brands who are shipping globally it's a level of safety, security, authenticity that's required by mothers of babies when they buy that is enormous. And there's a tremendous amount of work being done to put to leverage technology to make sure that there's no tamper, tampering, there's no co uh, copycatting, um, making sure that it's truly the brand that they, they feel confident about. So <clears throat> the technologies there, we've got a number of other examples of technologies that are being applied in, in, in Europe and in Asia, less so in the United States, and I'm not quite sure why, but um, they're widely available. Again, companies like Unilever, like Nestle, like Abbott Nutrition, uh, they, they've been employing some of them. And what's cool is that they provide a total supply chain benefit, um, not just safety, security, authenticity, but once the codes exist, uh, the opportunity to leverage that that technology to carry supply chain data and help your your manufacturing and your company from a data and analysis uh, perspective is also an important part that that can be integrated in. We we've done some work recently with a company called Digimark, uh, basically an invisible code that uh, carries so much information invisibly. And Procter and Gamble and and Walmart are doing work with it, and we see tremendous opportunity for that to provide new value as well. Thanks. Let's jump into one that's some more really packaging uh, fundamental. What packaging format do you see as being the most popular today 
and will it be the same in the future? So not only today, but you know, going forward. Bill, I'll give you a shot, and then I'll jump in. <laughs> uh, what is the? Uh, you go ahead. I, I, okay, <laughs> that's fine. You're the that's expert. Fine. You know, for the last several years, we've watched the growth of, uh, of flexibles and flexibles taking share from rigid packaging and then a number of different categories um, being perceived as uh, more convenient in a lot of ways, overall using less weight of packaging. Um, sustainability in the circular economy thing and maybe even security now um, in, the, in the drive towards, I mean, I, I, from what I've, I've seen, center of store sales have gone up and e-commerce has grown like crazy through this quarantine. As Phil said, we don't know how much of that's going to stick and stay, but you know, we, we've, we've seen prior to COVID a, a, an anti-plastics movement. Um, and by the way, we consider ourselves uh, material agnostic, package form agnostic. We think they're all good for the right reasons, but there, there's been this anti-plastic uh, move and anything that's even perceived by consumers to be made from trees in some way tends to be perceived to be better for the environment, whether it is or not, doesn't matter. And we've done some, some work around perceptions of, um, of products and brands that are most sustainable and, at the, and this was a few years ago, but drink boxes were seen as were is some of the best, most sustainable packages there are. And when we dug into it, we found out even though there may be seven layers of material, it's the paper on the outside that made the consumer believe that they were better for the environment. So that's a tough one, Ron. I, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure where the growth is going to be, but I, I think with the, the push on circular economy and the fact that we're going to have, you know, the world's going to be a billion people bigger before too long and resources are limited, we're going to continue to have to make really smart choices and just do what's right, whatever that package format is. Well, that brings up a good lead into the next question, which has to do with sustainability. Do you believe the consumer is ready to pay for sustainability initiatives? And you just kind of touched on that in a bit. Um, I'll say something at the beginning here. Uh, I was going to comment on sustainability and, and saying that uh, I just, uh, what you said about circular economy, I think if you take the long view on this, uh, we have no choice but to have a pretty significant conversion to natural materials and to things that uh, fit into a circular economy. Um, will people pay for it? Um, not so often. Um, I think that some of this may need to be, it may be uh, mandated, it may be through pressure brought on corporations and brands to move in that direction. Uh, that may be what drives it. Uh, you'll have some folks who pay a little extra, but I think we've all seen that. The, the people's interest in that kind of thing compared to what they're really willing to pay for it, there are two different things. My sense of it, right? Yeah, I, it, Phil's got a great handle on the marketplace and what people will and won't pay for. Uh, a few years ago, again, we did work for a, a major company that was essentially looking at a, a big investment in a biopolymer, um, and it was a supplier company. And we talked to, I think it was 40 some experts at major brands, uh, 40 some who worked in the technical side of the business. Uh, research and development, procurement, operations, and another 40-some who worked in marketing, and they were on the brand side of the business. And we had to go to them and say, okay, so this would be the concept. You could put X amount of this biopolymer into your new package, and they uh, would ask, you know, what what would it cost extra? And we'd say, well, there would be an increase in, in the cost. 100% of the people we spoke with on the technical side of the big brand companies said, our company will never, marketing will never pay for it. All they ever tell us is they want us to take costs out. Over 50% of the of the experts we spoke with who work on the brand side of the business said, we would definitely pay more. It would allow us to make a relevant claim in the marketplace. We would either increase the cost of our product or we would, we would take the risk on reducing our margin because we're looking to differentiate our, our brand and that would be something if we can make a, a, 
a reputable claim that we would consider switching to. Okay. All right, I think we're going to close out with this one because I think this is going to give you the uh, the big bell here. So what are your thoughts on the consumer in a post-COVID world that changes the direction of the future? You know, it's a, uh, we do a lot of work, as you know, Ron, and some, some of the listeners do on the future of packaging. We work with futurists. We leverage foresight. We've been issued. We are making changes. We know that consumers are experimenting more than they have in ages. Um, brands that, you know, you know, millennials and Gen Z and hardly familiar with because they were at the center of the store and they were long shelf life, dry items, canned items. They're eating them now and they're trying them and they may stay with those and they may become more familiar with those package formats. So, it, Safety, security is becoming more of an issue. Um, and I, I think packaging features that, uh, whether it's tamper evidence or just making sure that they're clean in some way. You know, we see beer cans that have plastic covers on them. Maybe that'll be more normal. We, we can't really predict the future, but there, there's a lot of things pointing to new opportunities. We, we think, um, you know, plastic bag bans in, in, in the various states, uh, the bans went away. We think the bans will come back. As Phil said, we've got to we've got to think, take the long term view, and really look at uh, what kind of things need to stick and what kind of things will will go back to. And and e commerce will not go back uh, to the numbers it was at. They've accelerated, and and we're getting more accustomed to um, home delivery of of groceries, food, and we need innovation. I, th I think innovation will be necessary and will drive uh, new solutions in all of those areas I talked about, whether it's e-commerce or um, circular economy or the Internet of Things. Yeah, and I just add, uh, my, uh, to, to Brian's very good list, one of the things I think is going to be more, one of the most fundamental changes, and I think is going to be important, is thinking of brands and companies in a humanized way and having an expectation that they, for me to buy a product or service, it has to reflect my values in some way. I think we're seeing that the role of brand as advocate is, is much bigger than ever was. Um, and and that, as I said earlier, I think that really puts a lot of uh, responsibility on packaging to help reinforce that and help convey it. And I think, uh, you know, demands for transparency and understanding um, materials and everything else uh, that goes into a product or service, but also um, just the gestalt of what is this, the totality of this brand represent, and does it fit with who I am as a person, rather than a transactional kind of feel. I think that's a big deal going forward. Agreed. Gentlemen, we've drawn to our time. We want to thank you. You guys never disappoint. Uh, again, reminding everyone who's on the call, the webinar will be up in a day or two on the contract packaging website. We'll issue a quick survey after this is over. Please answer it. And thank you all for attending. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Phil. And everybody have a great day.